reverb is maybe a little bit long for this. Let's maybe not use as much of the infinite reverb today. Sadly, I'm also uh, going to have a lot of mic handling noise. Uh, I don't know what I can do about that. I don't have a headset like Colin, so, uh, or at least not one that works in this system, but this ought to work. And finally, I need to turn this Moog the hell down because I'm going to be using it, but. just a joke. That was a musical joke of playing all the possible wrong notes. I think that was a 12 note scale. And uh, with that, no days off, I know, right? And I'm going to bring it up with all of this stuff going. this. 
because I have to demonstrate that. And this seems like a good chord to start on. So editing means I'll be fading it up. and what you're listening to is the Air Windows Chord Organ Firmware. And that is something I've been getting together. It's been working on this for months because I have a goal here which is similar to what a bunch of other people are working on at the same time. Like Colin Benders is doing work on this with a, uh, a thing called the Symphonian. The whole idea is to get forms and chords and musical things happening where um, it's sort of algorithmically making up the music. So what we're going to do, let me just take a moment and pull out all this weird stuff, like for instance this. If it's in order, your PC board or whatever. That's more chord organ type thingies. Let's pull that out. Pull that out. And while we're at it, we're also going to simplify some of these sounds a little bit. So chord organs or what you're hearing now. It's these things. And I can also, if I'm careful and don't strangle myself with these chords or knock the entire thing over, people joke about Colin's uh, laptop falling over. It could be much worse here if I'm not careful. Um, I've got a setup here where, for instance, I can pull one of these wires, unplug these things, and what you're hearing now apparently is uh, leftover stuff, I guess, and no matter, that's fine. I'm really not sure where some of that is coming from. Let me kill even more of these outputs. Yeah. I think some of this is just my various filters. Don't mind that. I'm not able to get all of this. You know, modular systems have a life of its own, and that's what we're here to do. We are trying to make these. Raw output of chord organs into the complicated music like you just heard. So what is a chord organ? It is a form of, here, let me just patch in the, this guy. That's a little loud, unfortunately. But, uh, so a chord organ is this little digital module. These guys here and it's a variation on the radio music module, which is these guys here. And you've got wiring the sucker up. Heavy solid wires. This is also this relevant is, really also heavy heavy guitar here. pickups and things. Going from the jacks to the uh, Gibson pickups. With a individual uh, resistors and things are solder wires. These two. Probably if you have a magnet between third, 
Let me just kill this one and make this one be mono and kill that ARP and uh, get a lot of handling noise on the mic. Don't mind that, please. And so I do, 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 so here's another chord organ trick right off the bat. I can take this and sweep it around using a CV. And what we get is the chord organ module, which is a sample player and it's being re-triggered at audio frequencies. It's being re-triggered at the bass frequency coming off of this one. It's slightly different because this particular bass has a octave component, so it's not doing it as cleanly as it might. But if you have a really clean square wave, then that'll work out fairly well. I don't think I have anything on here right now that works for that. Really what I need to do bit. is learn how to quantize slew rates. Then we can see what that sounds like too. So this is a square wave off of no coast. So this is a trick that I often use. And this is all being done with the raw output of a radio music module. But the raw output of a chord organ module is different. Because we have a better chance of getting... We're going to kill that radio music. Or just make it shut up, more like and get into the topic of discussion here, which is doing this stuff with the chord organ. You can hear it is playing a sequence of notes. And I can switch over if I don't kill myself by yanking these cables around. Sorry, forgive me for struggling with this. It's a really cumbersome setup right here. Let's go over to the chords. This is the output of the chords and it's following the same chord sequence as before. In fact, I should be able to bring in the bass that I use is the sine output, which is this first entry on the chord organ, running through some uh, things. Like if I scroll over this way, what I've got here is a Turing machine that's making this pattern. Like I can make the bass shut up now. And then if it starts playing notes, the bass will come back in again. And you can, these are pulses outputs, also something from the Turing machine. And one of them is playing the pulse that's coming in and the other one is patched through into the gate. Uh, the gate output that's normally used for this volts output, which is simultaneously, you can run multiple things off of them. So the pulses is getting the raw pulses and the gate output of the Turing machine is going to both this volts module, which is upside down, and this pulses module. And what that does is I get to do a uh, something that stays on if it's a long note, I get the pulse, and the pulse is being used for an attack on the bass note. And then the volts is also, they're going through this logic module, and I'm getting the sum of the two things. 
so that if I turn this up a little bit, I can start bringing in the note underneath the attack. So I get a bass that is randomly making stuff up. Currently, this module is telling it to um, do a really strange sequence of, it's, it's stuck at the maximum there, it's not random. But the um, volume can be turned up. So when we talk about having a bass player as part of our modular system, this is what I do for that purpose. Namely, take it and make that be pretty much literally the case. And that I've got a system set up where I'm playing notes, it's based on a sine wave. And I'm basically using a digital VCA from WMD to um, VCA the thing. And this is my envelope, is the pulse. You can hear it there. And then the body of the note. And I can also, I've got it running through a sans amp, so it gets a slight distortion. In fact, I can, people often say like, oh man, your bass is kind of distorting, well check this out. get lots of distortion out of it. Now we can also listen to another patch which is high ambient. You can hear it's the same chord. I'll be getting into how these chords are made pretty soon. Um, by the way, I can actually see live chat. So if people do have questions about what this is, this is a firmware for the, oh, I'm covering up my microphone and everything. This is a firmware for the chord organ module that I've come up with and I'm talking people through how to use this stuff and how I'm doing the stuff that I do using it. And I'm trying to desperately adjust my microphone so it isn't terrible. Um, that's a little better. And this time my voice can be heard unlike the previous one that I did where you, all the music came through but you couldn't hear any voice. And then I've got one more thing over here, which you'll hear is not exactly the same note. And it's called HR, that's for high arpeggio. And that's going to be done using this thing a moment later in a bit. Um, so what do we have here? That was the raw sounds of things. And I can also show you that um, you can specify chords like this. And although it seems to show a square wave indicator, these are booting up in a, a form where it's booting up with a different setting, but the initial setting is always sine. So you're hearing the sine thing pretty much straight through, no filtering. This is the square. This is the saw. And then uh, my firmware tends to replace this other thing. You notice it's just gone to a different chord pattern. And I use a triangle wave because that's one of the default ones that you can get out of the uh, TC. It's a slightly different voice. I think that the triangle wave is very useful. And uh, Phobos, by all means, you can ask questions because otherwise it's just me chatting away like mad. And this, that's fine too, but. So what I'm gonna do is unplug this and we're gonna go back to our filters, our filters that are kind of making noises of their own some of the time. And I tend to patch my lows into a Richter dual Borg. Cause I want like some nice heavy bassiness out of these low chords. And the Richter dual Borg is real good for that. In fact, I can do crazy things like this one, you can give them feedback, but you can also give the initial one feedback. And this is 
what I get sometimes out of these. The trick to working with these uh, chord organs is as you heard, the raw sound is not really up to your best of analog oscillator standards. It's a teensy, it's like a 12-bit generator. So what you do is throw weird filters on them. And maybe some oscillation. Not sure how well you can see my hand doing this, but there's a dual work down here. And I do this with them. And then you can change the setting for that. And we're going to leave it on a sawtooth. And you can throw different kinds of oscillations and things in there. I'm going to kill the resonance so that it's a very simple, ordinary sound. And we'll leave it pretty much like that. Then I'm going to patch in high ambient. High ambient is currently running something much like the bass, which the bass is currently like a, with this here. this Turing machine currently is not playing any notes. So the bass is just laying out for the moment just because it happened to uh, not have any notes in its uh, thing. The high ambient is being triggered with exactly the same formula, which is a pulse. It's a little hard to hear, so I'll turn it up on the... Uh So if I turn this volts off, then the VCA, and there's another thing about this as well, which is these uh, WND DVCAs, I have them biased to on. That's why it's playing continuously. If I stop that, we stop getting all that dual Borg. I'll leave it off for the moment. And we're getting only, actually that's not true because the dual Borg is getting a very slow LFO for its uh, CV. This is what's causing that to happen. So in the initial jam I had this patched into a sloths and it's making some quiet noises come in, although I think I had it just cranking. Well, we'll leave that out for the moment. And high ambient uh, the music thing modular chord organ that's going through a filter. We'll pan over to those again, which I can add resonance, and that's what's causing that little woodblock sound. That would be happening even if I didn't have any chords coming through it, and we'll We'll give high ambient, I think, a square for talking about. And it's the same deal. And again, it's this is being generated by a bunch of... Uh, yep, and Phobos has a quick question. The chord organ does indeed produce waveforms that sound like chords. It does not produce CVs. Although you can get stuff. I would like to do this all over again with distings, because distings would provide CVs that you could run to regular oscillators. Anyways, we've got our bass kind of laying out and not playing anything at the moment because its chord organ is decided not to play any notes. And our uh, high ambient is being played by this one, which you can see actually doing stuff, or at least I think you can. Um, the chords are still changing on a regular basis. We'll get all of these things going again at some point. Um, for instance, if I turn the CV of this one up, we can hear that it's on the same chords. And the reason is all this stuff is norm is uh, molted together with these little patch chords that I wired up that are just, uh, oh, and notice, I'm touching them and I'm making them go crazy. A little uh, feedback there. 
but these wires are connecting the outputs of these things to all these inputs in a line. And that's how you can molt into um, chord organ modules. I have not yet got into the theory of how this was all done, which is this stuff here. But, um, and I do have stuff printed up to help explain that. But here again, the envelopes for this are done by this kind of thing. It's another, it's another Turing machine setup. And we've got the Turing machine doing the thing. And the attack is this pulse output. And then the gate output is off of a volts. So I can select different things. Also notice our bass has come back. It's decided it wanted to play that note. So it's doing a little bit of that. And if you pick different ones, you can uh, set it up so that, like this is flipped over and upside down to fit with these jacks. Um, the uh, one input also corresponds to this knob if it was right side up. So you can have in both of these things, they can both be off or You can start bringing in the uh, continued note that's tied to that initial pulse that you see going here. I'm going to pull the gain down on the bass a little bit so that the um, attack isn't quite so hot. Remember, we've also got this other stuff going on where I could have beats and things happening too. But this is mostly about explaining how the chord organ stuff works because it's a little more even sophisticated than I've showed yet. We're working up to the, uh, the real truth of what's happening in here. Because you might have noticed, now we are playing an interesting chord sequence. Like, I got my Moog over here. And it's playing in these notes. chord organ works, and here let me kill the bass rather than make this into a jam, this is meant to be talking about how the new firmware works. More coffee Chris, get this thing going. So what we're going to do is stop the beat for a moment and show you something else by unpatching in. Now, all this stuff is just playing the raw zero volt. So, So it's all patched through, right? We can turn these things on. We're not hearing this one yet, but it's in there. Here's what's going on with these. And I uh, wonder if I can... Give me a second while I try to get the bass actually playing something here. So this is all we're working with, right? If we patch a cable with just a voltage to this,
this, which is the root of all of these, they are going to step upwards in a circle of fifths. And a circle of fifths is this chart. So what does it sound like to follow this chart? Let me do it a little more subtly. say. What happens when we patch it through to this voltage? What we're going to get is something called a chord. And this is how the chord organ works. I printed these up. Here's a nice basic one. I never did label them, but whatever. Um, so if you patch through to NB here, which is going through to the chord input, this is what we get. And I'm gonna pull the bass out because I'm gonna trust that you I'm gonna trust that you get like, yeah, that's a bass in there. It was rather loud and excessive. This is what the chord does. Sounds kind of similar, yeah? So what's happening here, let me put some of this stuff back together so that we have this going along and these inputs are controlling the internals of the chord organ so that it knows what to play. So if we say, I'll patch this through two stages so that I have a more subtle effect going on. Let's patch it into here, a root note. So we've basically gone, I think it's from F, C to G to D. Except for C sharp for some reason. But anyways. I think our default uh, root chord might not be the actual major. The point is that this is supposed to wander around using voltages. It's not designed to be done as just like play this zero note for the chord or something. It's supposed to be in a structure where things are arranged by circle of fifths. Why circle of fifths? Because if you change from a C to a G, either this way or this way, if you were playing this kind of stuff so that you're in, say, key of C, which is, this is actually C-sharp, but, um, and you play a G chord, you can play a G seventh, and if you start in this key of G, you're in Mixolydian mode now. You can play a D, you'd be playing a D minor to also fit with these, the notes associated with the C major. We're doing modal stuff, these are modes, and you'd be playing in a Dorian mode. What this means is... Where's my random voltages? And which one's associated with the chord? B. So right now what we've got this set up to do is a, a um, touring machine is feeding changing voltages at the speed of the trigger blinking. 
and it is changing only the chord, all of these are going to be in the same note. Now, if we start doing weird things with this, where's our uh, core generator? It's this. So, and let's make it a sequence of three. Now we're in major. And let's write to make something else happen. You can hear it's the same notes. We're in the same key. Let's go to two, see if that gives us anything. I also have a scale thing here, and that's gonna give me totally different results too. If I change this, it will offset, like I can, if I move this to here, it'll just repeat forever. So you see we've got a very major sounding thing. If I change the scale, I'm offsetting the random voltage that's coming out of the chord organ. And we're going to different chords now. But it's only changing the chord, so we're all in the same key. Played a wrong note there. It didn't fit in the key, but everything else that was originally in the key. And this is getting into the heart of what we're doing with this setup. Enough weirdness, enough of this unusual mode that we're in. Bam, back to major. So that's what the chord input is doing. Now if we unplug that, here we are back in whatever our root chord is. We're no longer putting random voltages into here. But let's do the opposite. We're going to do the root. And that is voltage from this one. I've got a separate one because it can be moving on a sort of XY axis here. Rather than selecting chords from the vertical slice here. And again, this is circle of fifths, but you're picking minors and majors according to what fits. Everything has to fit within the same uh, key. Like you can be playing in Locrian and B minor and you're in the same uh, set of notes as C major. But if we change the root, and let's take a moment uh, without dropping my, uh, you stay. Take a moment, unplug this, plug this in. We're going to do a little manual change. And you can
can hear that's also doing that little pattern that's a circle of hips pattern. It's sort of bumping up and down a little bit, kind of unpredictably, but... But the difference is we're not going along this anymore. We're offsetting the root, so we're offsetting the entire scale. If this was a normal chord organ, you could do this and it would be chromatic. And in fact, we can go pretty far. It'll let you put a pretty high voltage into it, but the calculation is still being done with this circle of fifths change, and that's the primary thing that I did with this. Because the thing here is, um, at least with my version of the firmware, not with the stock version, you can program in the chords, and I'll show you what that looks like. Because chord organ works like this. You have these, and they're part of the, uh, the firmware that you put on the little SD card. So you'll notice these don't all start with zero. This starts with zero because it's starting on C, or at least what it thinks is C. This is minus five because it's starting on G. This is two because it's starting on D, but it's a minor chord, so I'm spelling the notes out so that it's playing a minor chord. You can select the 16 chords any way you want, at least with the, the firmware that I did. With the firmware that I did, it um, correctly lets you pick different ones. With the stock firmware, there's a minor bug where it always tries to include a zero, and uh, me and my brother Dan fixed that. Um, but with the Airwindows firmware, you can pick any numbers you want. You can pick from zero to eight different uh, chord sections, for instance. Here's a, ba here's a uh, actually that's not a good example, that's the, here is, here is a bass that has three notes and it is selecting uh, octaves. It's got two root notes and one octave note. And here is a ambient high chord where you're selecting four notes and it's giving you four notes to play with. So the chord thing picks among these, and at least in the Air Windows version, and to some extent in the, the stock version, you can write whatever you want in there. You can like write crazy chords in. Part of the concept that I've got here is picking chords that will let you stay within that key. You pick chords that are playing different chords, they're along this pattern, and that means you can keep playing in the same key. But, if you're doing this... We're rotating. We're kind of going to the same things, but you'll notice that it's not minors this time. This time, if we're going to the G, we're going to a G major, not a G seventh. It's not going to the Mixolydian mode, it's going to a different mode. And you can play Mixolydian over it, but the scale is very slightly different. You go to here, and it can continue by continuing onwards. still sounds a little consonant. What I'm going to try to do is I'm going to select one where it no longer works with the key. And I'm going to have to go fairly far to do it. Okay, now let's play the Moog over that. And we'll bring in... Here's the notes I started with that worked perfectly over the original thing. We are now in the key as something like B or whatever. And because we didn't use the original way of doing this,
Our notes are super different now. Like we've got this D in here that was not in the previous one. Actually, we're on the white keys now. We were heavily on the black keys earlier, like here. And then if we make that adjust to here, My point being, using this, which is the root input, it's circle of fifths, and with this it is possible to change the key quite radically. So let me try that again. I had it going earlier. I've got almost no black keys left now. And again, if we rotate it back from this place that's all black keys, as we've gone really far around the circle of fifths without just doing it within the chords, so all of our notes are different. Go back down to C, or go back down to the original one, and we've gone far away. Now here's the deal, here's what's going on with that. Also I'm noticing I'm not seeing a lot of questions, which is cool, uh, but you can in fact ask them, and it's gonna take me a long time to get through all of this. Last thing I see is Piff Paff going, hey, hey, and yeah. What's up, Piff Paff? Um, the secret to this is that if you do small changes, Every time you move one step over, one note changes in your scale. Only one note, because it's circle of fifths. If it was not circle of fifths, the notes would be changing very rapidly. But the way this is set up anywhere you are, if the voltage changes only slightly and the root note um, varies only slightly from what you started with, And again, this is on the root. It seems to be a fairly big jump, but only one note in the scale will change. And this makes the whole thing possible because what we get here is chord and chord inversion changing in a way that can be followed. That's the heart of all of this. Now you can get fancier by throwing in more full chord inversions in your programming. Like we've got, I've got this set up at the moment so that I'm doing fairly simple chords. Let me take this. And what we've got is um, each of these are doing something random. The chord assigned one is, as you can see, going on a pattern of three. I could tell it to be four or five or whatever. And the root one is currently not doing anything at all because uh, that's just what the Turing machine felt like doing at the moment. But here's the secret. I've got this scale thing here, 
and it's actually going through and out down into this thing which I wired up myself and which feeds in something else. The uh, this Turing machine that is also running the uh, it's running this keyboard and making its pattern. I have the output of it going off another scale and adding very slightly to both of these voltages, but it's happening faster. So what happens is if we do this, I start getting crazy chords happening. Because these are still doing the bass chord changes, but now I have an added voltage coming in. And this extra voltage is causing those changes. But it's a very small amount being added, it's a very, very small amount of voltage. It's just changing like one over or one chord over. So the, the modulations that it's adding are still uh, fairly random. I see another question, let me read. Uh, do I have the version of the circle online so you can use it as, not yet, but I probably can do that by the end of the day. And the way I organize the scales is in line with another guy who I mean to link to his YouTube thing, who is like how you can hear modes. And he has a sequence of modes where only one note changes between each mode as you keep going. It's organized in a really useful way. So I'm using that. It turned out to be exactly commensurate to the circle of fifths, which was kind of neat. It's just, you know, what you decide to start on. So what we've got is a seemingly very arbitrary thing going on. Like it sounds like madness, but if I play on it on the moat, It's a little tough because it's jumping around so much, but if I turn this weird extra thing off, happening here is it's throwing a lot of random chords at me but if I'm lucky and I'm not pushing it too far then it's still possible to follow it even though you can plainly hear it's going to a bunch of funny places like if I turn this knob up so I'm throwing extra random stuff in there it gets really active so it like But because this is all based on circle of fifths, and uh, and because they only change like one time at a time, you have half a chance of being able to follow stuff even when it's as random as this. It's really going to some unusual places that way, but it's still fairly. Sometimes when I do this, it loses me because I'm taking on too much. Like I make it go too wild and then it's hard to follow. Like I still have a little more offset in here. If I shut this down, then I'm fairly likely to be able to find it on the Moog. Those four notes are chromatically linked. And you 
can hear how it's wandering from key center to key center, but the places it's going are not too crazy. Now, what would be too crazy? I can show you that as well. Like when we're doing this, um, these scale knobs are setting how far this stuff can wander. Like if I turn it right down, there's literally no change. It's all sticking to this gray, this this um, major thing, because the random voltages are no longer doing anything. It's incredibly sensitive to these. In fact, they're going through a resistance pad to go into these inputs. But if I start change, turning them up a lot, chord and root are now getting big jumps. And that means it's going to throw in some weird chords. So it's going to become much harder to follow. And you'll notice that the root is no longer doing anything random. Let's make that change. Let's make both of these change lots. I'm setting the Turing machines to throw in many more random things. Because as long as this is nothing in here, it's going to stick to the same chord. So that makes it easy mode. When, when the root is not shifting, we're playing all in the same line of chords. We're playing all in the same modal structure. And I put right in. Now we're gonna start getting something more interesting happening because our scale here is very high. Apparently back to nothing in the root. Tell you what, let's start throwing faster chord changes by trigger select. I'm pretty sure this is what this is. I'm still doing four chords, but now they're revolving much more fast. Uh, um, hi Ahmed, Ahmed is uh, one of my usual Air Windows followers. No, this is me demonstrating the chord organ firmware and there's some folks from uh, Colin Bender's modular server that are interested in seeing it. This is my product, but it's going to take me a long time to talk through it, so I'm basically doing a live stream and going through the whole entire thing. Which is a enormous process, may I say. But, um, and here we just lost everything and this, this chord organ keeps deciding that it wants to be in all zeros. So if we have the root note changing more radically because the scale is high so the random voltage is higher, it'll go to places that are much harder to follow even if chord was literally just zero. Like varying root and not chord means we're no longer choosing these chords. We no longer can stay in the same mode. Every chord is gonna be a different mode slightly. And this is what normally happens with random stuff and generative music in modular. So if I try to play along with this,
this is what you normally get with random generation. It is not fun and it is not very useful because it's too hard to follow. We got these big changes, but it's changing the entire scale out from under us every moment. Whereas if we do the opposite, now we're not changing the root note at all, but we're changing this uh, line of chords in here. And every single one of these chords is going to be in the same mode. Now here is the point. We don't have to use really high voltages for these offsets. If we're doing voltages to change this stuff around in a generative way, give us chords and things where what we're doing is not just only us doing it, but the synthesizer is also coming up with stuff to do. We can give it only small offsets And we can give offsets based on this chord rather than just only the. Uh, we can do offsets based on the chord. And wander as far as we want along this axis, and it'll always be in the right key. Or we can put random voltages through the root, rotate around this wheel without going to majors and minors relative to the key. And if we pick large offsets, we're jumping really far along the wheel. But if we pick small offsets, only one note changes in the scale. It can still throw some weird stuff at us as far as funny little variations that we wouldn't expect if we're just mechanically staying within the same, you know, like get a quantizer and set it up so that it can, you can only play within this mode. We'll get funny stuff happening, but if it's a small offset, then the funny stuff isn't going to be too crazy. And combining these things, We get chord sequences that can wander around within a more localized area. Or if you had a bunch of uh, voltage offsets, put just a fixed value in there, then you're starting from here. But if it's wandering around in a small area on this chart, it's possible to follow what it's doing. It's not too crazy because this is always in the same mode. And small changes in here are only one uh, note in the scale being changed. Which brings us to the final thing on the chord organ, although I do also want to take a moment and uh, talk about some of the details here. Don't mind me drinking more coffee. You'll notice I haven't plugged this one in yet, and there's a reason for that. In fact, I didn't ever need to plug this in because it didn't give you an infra a useful uh, piece of information. I need to get another patch cable out of here. I just grabbed this to talk about some of the settings, which I have not gotten into yet. Um, I'm going to have to restart the machine to do some of that stuff, but that's fine too. Where's my cables? Here's my cables. So if I run a cable over to here and then turn this guy on, it's been pre-patched to do some things. And if I, let's see, where's my voltage coming from? It's coming from here. So, let me see if I can get this making an audible noise. And let's 
give this one a straight voltage, which are, here we go. So what's going on with this? This is a separate thing. I call it the ARP one, and I, I came up with it because I was watching Colin Benders doing some stuff, and I was like, I want one of these. Um, as you can hear, it's not playing the root note. What it's playing is, let me dig it up and show you literally what the chord chart is for this one. Here we go. ARP is playing these notes. As you can see, it's kind of stepping up one at a time. Like the root note is zero, that's the, the that's what we're getting here. And then you got two, four, five, seven, nine, eleven, twelve. It's going from the, its lowest note to its highest note along the mode that you're in. So if we cut these things off for a moment. And I start increasing this voltage on this ARP one. And I'm actually getting a random variation in here, but don't don't mind that. What I'm what I'm patching the volt the amplitude into is slightly different. And we've gone to a slightly different... Either we've gone to a slightly different thing, or I, I programmed this wrong. Wait, our high notes are slightly wrong. Okay, don't, that might be a bug fix for later. I'm not worried about that right now. You can hear that it's going up and down randomly, right? So what would we get if we programmed a random source into that? Let's take a random voltage. And this is just a random voltage off the yield coast. And whenever the clock increments, which is not the same as the, the beat here, it's picking a random one. Now we have a random melody that is locked to the key that we're in. But wait, there's more. What if we patched it into a repeating source like my Mimetic Digitalis over here? And what if I patched its amplitude thing into the slope output of this O coast? So what I'm doing is now I've got something that is generating both um, a new random voltage for me, and I can I can trim that to be larger or, or higher, and it's also making an envelope for me, and it's being triggered off of something else. hear it kind of going. Let's see, this is my FM input, so there's randomness on tap there. I can switch this filter to the bright, give it a little resonance. And the Mimetic Digitalis here is giving me a new thing based on its position as it steps through this. So if I get these things together and using the, uh, this one that's a scale rather than following the ARPs, I can do this.
And that is the most recent uh, development here on So this is what I'm going to be getting into going forward with this stuff is um, chords available and the chords are doing this thing where I'm able to follow them like right now I've got these turned down all the way and we're only in G so let's let's go a step further these on until I've got some changes going in here. And we're going to keep this by making the uh, Turing machines be um, not very prone to change. And now that we've got this going and it's playing our little pattern on the Mimetic Digitalis, now we throw in chord changes. that a little warmer. So now what we've got is our chords. And then we've also got an ARP going on, which is playing at this rate at the moment. The ARP is playing its own little pattern, which is this pattern. If you were in only a major key and a C, but then we include a little bit of this offset and more of this offset. And now it's starting to really go. The um, thing is actually following these chords. This has still got this patched in to the um, root offset, which is what gives us our key that we're in. So effectively what's happening here is, um, shuffling my papers, the ARP one, HR, the high ARP, is picking only a scale within this key. It doesn't care what the chord is, so we're using the chord offset just to determine which of the 16 notes is available. And we can pick lower notes by scaling it down, or higher notes by scaling it up. Some of my high notes seem a little bit funny, I might need to change that. Um, and then when the chords change to a different key, it's still selecting the notes within this key. So our ARP is going to follow the key and um, any weirdness that happens, like we can throw in on this one, those offsets. Where now we can make sudden changes and the ARP is going to follow those changes, even if they're weird, abrupt, busy. It will get a little overwhelming when I have too much going on. That's one of the challenges uh, in this thing that I made uh, a while back, a uh, explanation of modular genres. I called this stuff lacquerhead. Lacquerhead is when you have too many things happening so fast that you can't really comprehend it anymore. And it's overwhelming. Like we can take this, uh, which 
starts out as something that's very simple. And over on the Ocoast here where I'm triggering it all. Some of this stuff, like the little trills there, that's being generated by the root of the chord changing, which is why you're not getting a envelope on those. But if you're listening carefully to it, get is the thing where the crazy little arp doing its trills it's following this stuff that's built into the chords doing the same trills so it'll kind of come together sort of in the long run there We're giving the ARP a uh, square wave now. And our chords are still going in the background. We've got the chord scale set fairly high, but not all that high. And then the root changes are not that high. So in theory, it would be possible to play along with this on the Moog, which I will now try to do a little bit. because this scale I put down here is in fact changing the root rather often. So let's cut it right back. I think we're actually on the white keys now. The mode that we're in has got uh, two sharps in it. if we turn the cycle on here so we're starting to actually animate the envelope of that uh, ARP then it can start doing more interesting things. We've got that going on. Okay. So if you're saying, let's do it. 
uh, what, a new weekly stream like this? I don't know. Uh, this is just me trying to do a particular thing and make it work. Uh, I have no idea how long I've even been going. Um, and I'm just trying to cover what uh, needs to be talked about about this, because this is all being generated by the Music Thing Modular Chord Organ and Turing Machine. With the little kick drum in there, just for the hell of it. And in fact, I can do amusing things as well. Like if I wanted to, I can do this. We are no longer triggering or re-triggering the Ocoast, and we are no longer re-triggering the Mimetic Digitalis. We should no longer be re-triggering the Mimetic Digitalis. I can make absolutely sure of that, however, by unplugging this extra wire. I'm trying to figure out why it wants to jump around every now and then. I think maybe it's... Uh a funny uh, end of clock thing going where the end of clock seems a little jittery. Maybe because it's too slow. fix that by... Can I fix that? I can by patching this in here. I'm going to take this whole thing and stop cycling it and trigger it instead. On this. try to get a smoother triggering off of this. I'm running the trigger into uh, N on the Mimetic Digitalis, meaning that um, it should be regularly refiring. The thing is that uh, end of cycle doesn't seem to be working as predictably as I'd like. This is being triggered off of the just friends, so I can sort of reclock that. And then, if I remove the retrigger from that, and try to get a Separate, there we go. Another thing that we can do here is um, have this whole rhythm going on. And then obviously it's a bit of a pain in the butt to make it work, but um, I can re-trigger the um, attack. this little note. You can hear it quite plainly there. And that's being re-triggered off of this Just Friends, separately from the main clock. It's a little twitchy, which is one of the things you can get out of analog hardware. Some of the connections get kind of funky, and that can produce interesting effects in its own right.
And if I told all these notes in the mimetic digitalis to be zero, oh wait, I have to enable this all first. If I turn these channels on, which I'm making be random, and I told these to be zero, they would all be the same note. And if I shred them, I get something more random happening. But it's still a regular sequence. Like, I can put this trigger input to X. And it's playing a simple sequence. In fact, just for fun, let's make it go back to the main clock again. And as you can hear, it's playing the sequence because this randomly varying voltage is going into the uh, high arpeggio thing, which is just a scale, like this scale. I wonder if I can stand these up. Probably not. Yes, we can. So I'm giving it random variations. I can shred it again. And that's a random variation, and it's cycling on only this thing on the mimetic digitalis because I told it to be only on the X input. Or I could go vertically on the mimetic digitalis and You can also hear that since it's going into the chord organs and the chord organs are being fed the root, it's following the chords, whatever the rate is, like... It can be a different clock and it's still following the same pattern and it's still following the chords which are coming from a completely separate place. And then if I change the chords, so they're going to totally different stuff. Because it's all being driven off of these voltages that are molded together, it's gonna follow any changes that the chords or the root do. I've now got those set to a fairly radical thing, and I can set it to a sequence of five chords and make it go twice as fast, like this. Let me do a seven on this because that's not one of the options. Although it will let me do a six. And again, we can run the ARP separately because this is the the high ARP. It's with this sequence of. Oh, you can't actually see it. I got it stacked up, but you can't see it. doing that so the notes it's choosing go along with the chords because they're in the same scale but the chords can do whatever the hell they want as you can hear and this is me turning the cycle on on the O coast so it's now re-triggering but it's being also re-triggered by this if I unplug that this 
back to N, which is stepping forwards, although it's acting really the raw um, end o'clock out of the O coast is freaking out the mimetic digitalis. Although this is sometimes just something that can be fun to play with, like. If I have it set up like this, it's going kind of fast. And if it's being sort of spazzy with the, uh, the re-triggering click, sometimes it'll jump around in predictable ways. Like it'll be playing a similar melody each time it comes through. And then I can use the rise time to slow it right down again. how easily you can see this over here. I can, uh, does this show up on the... Perhaps not. Maybe I'm just zoomed in that close. So let's rotate this camera over a bit. I've been talking about those, but we've also got these. This is what's causing all of that uh, wackiness. And you can see this is a mimetic digitalis. run it in several different ways. Like here is a clocked input that's coming through and if I can turn it back on. And, oh. That's now incrementing on a regular basis or And if I tell this to be on the X, it'll be offsetting that. Whereas if this one that's currently just being a sort of free clock is simultaneously in there, both of those increments are going to happen. here somewhere is actually a reset like O here is go back to origin so if I can move this up here and stretch it it's gonna constantly keep going back to the origin point Depending on how twitchy this clock output is, it's going to give us weird effects that I think we can kind of see. It's hard to tell how well you can see it there. This camera is not really positioned to show this. We can do a whole other thing on Mimetic Digitalis. Maybe uh, we're not doing that today. But this is, this is what I've come up with in trying to follow the inspiration of the stuff that Colin Benders likes to do with ARPs, where he can be doing stuff like this. I'm a little bit too exaggerated there. And if I put the trigger of this on as well, Be sure and plug it in. What I can do is get a much more orderly behavior going on where we're still doing mimetic digitalis. This has randomization. But now rather than doing the crazy re-triggering, which is done with this cycle input. Um, it's just being triggered by the main clock. And that can give me a more normal ARP. So 
yeah, this this all kind of evolves in the idea is to be able to do something like grab a guitar or a, a, a guitar going into a synthesizer patch, which I also like to do, and have this stuff going on where it's going to evolve and change. Like I'm still on that five chord thing. Let's go back to a four. So what I basically need out of this is to be able to uh, have it going like this. You can hear it sort of staying in one place. Part of that is because I've got these touring machines set to very consistently. Although you'll notice we just changed a little bit. I can set the touring machines to be slightly more twitchy. And dial back these intensities a little bit so that it'll stay more normal. That's the, the essence of it, is doing this kind of stuff so that the synthesizer can start throwing in its own variations that you as a player then have to follow. And you can follow it by, say, being the synthesis and going like, let's have a... a re-trigger on this ARP. setting it up in a way where it's fairly predictable, playing with the filters. And you do stuff like that. But you should also be able to be playing a guitar or something along with all this and have it think of new stuff to do that it then puts into action. Like, eventually this bass might evolve to not having any notes. It'll be like... And then without you playing anything, because it's a Turing machine and it's doing random stuff, it will have come up with a... Pause. Meanwhile, the chords have shifted slightly because they're also Turing machine. But any any random source could do as well. And in so doing, the idea is that the machine is also thinking of some stuff. And the whole point of this chord organ stuff I've been doing, I've, I've been doing it ever since I was using this as the uh, reference chart, which is organized slightly differently. It's organized so that the major and minor are right next to each other and they're more spelled out chords. The current way I've got it set up is much more in terms of triads and I'm not including the sevenths in things unless I have to. Although I could throw that in as well. As you can hear, I'm not touching it got bass in now. It didn't have that before. fairly slightly changes, small changes, and there can also be changes where you grab a patch cord or something and you go, okay, let's have the CV of this filter be tied to a slots. 
And now, this is going to slowly evolve because it's tied into a uh, a SLOS module, which is a slow chaotic module. And it'll all kind of drift into different directions and do different things. Here's another trick is um, on this ARP here, I've got it with the rise time maxed out and there's a cycle in here. So I can pick different speeds using the fall time because it's triggering on the end of cycle. And that's what's making this happen. double timing it. But if I'm doing that and then I slow down the rise time, I can get a different tone that's playing a different kind of melody and then snap it back to zero rise time if I want a quick double time. And if I had that rise time on a CV, I could program that and make it do the double time when like this light went on. And if the light was on a CV on a, a Turing machine, then it could sort of evolve into doing that and start from a situation like this where nothing is actually happening with these two voices until the Turing machines decide to make them happen. And as you can see, I've got it very simple now. Because the rise time is so slow, that this voltage coming into origin is constantly resetting it. These jams are being generated entirely by the Air Windows firmware on a Music Thing Modular Chord Organ. And those are the only voices you're hearing, especially once I cut the sub kick. They're going through filters and things. Don't get me wrong, they are going through filters and things, but... But filters help these uh, modules sound a little bit richer as well. Now, there are also some changes that I've made. Um, I've grabbed uh, some more pieces of paper for things. And I'll try to talk you through this for anybody who's maybe like listening in the future. So I've, I've exhausted everybody so much, there's like five people left, but that's fine. Because this is a reference for future use of this stuff. And my previous reference, the voice was completely dead. Um, I had a lot of music going through it, but the voice was totally inaudible. So this is somewhat helpful in that uh, at least we can hear it a little better now. Let's make it do a fun thing while we're talking. thing. And let's give it just a little bit of kick. Ah, uh, chasing people away like mad. Well, the point is that this is here for people to refer to if you want to sit through this and figure out how to use the Air Windows Corp module. So I've got some slight changes also that um, 
these modules that you're hearing, they're modified. They're not quite stock. So I've got a 1000 picofarad capacitor on C1, which is normal. That's what you start off with. But it's a polystyrene cap. And I like the tone of that a little better. You can also omit capacitor 1, C1 if you want the whole thing to be kind of rolled off. For instance, if you know that you're going to use it for a base or something, and that is not a correct uh, way of building the circuit. It's not the way it was designed, but it does work. And you're going to get a much darker tone out of it if you leave C1 off. Now the DAC is putting out one volt so it needs a couple of capacitors in between it. It's got a capacitor going to a op amp and then it's got a capacitor between two op amps. What I'm using is tantalum capacitors rather than the little tiny, it's, it's a 0.1 microfarad capacitor between these and I don't feel that it gives you enough base. So I've selected some 10 microfarad tantalum capacitors and the important thing is that the plus of the polarized capacitor needs to be pointing towards the DAC because it's got about one volt on there. Between the op amps it seems like it doesn't actually have any voltage at all. So I'm using the same orientation there because it doesn't seem to matter. If you're using tantalums, which I'm using on purpose because I think they get the right tone, um, don't give them negative voltage, they can blow up. Now, the way that I've designed some of these things is um, I've got multiple different bases. In fact, I think I have them kicking around here. I can hold those up to the screen as well to the extent that that's useful. So again, this is the... Um, or ARP. It's a scale. This is not following the chords. The ARP settings are just a scale. And I think my very highest notes... My highest settings might be a little screwed up. Might need to change those highest notes. My low chords are like this. These are sort of starting at zero, which is, I guess, middle C or whatever it is. You'll notice that the, these other settings that are um, like triangle gives you the triangle in the fourth setting. There's also one that you can pick, which is uh, waves, and it gives you three more banks of wavetable sounds. The thing is, I'm not including that yet because I'd like to make my own wavetables and use those, and I haven't yet done that. There's been a lot to do with all of this. But this is what you get with downloading the Air Windows Chord Organ firmware. You'll get all of these as text files, and you put the text file in an SD card and stick it into the synthesizer, and then it uses it. You have to restart the synthesizer to do that. And that is like my chords for the sort of first position there. Here are some uh, high chords. As you can see, they're using numbers like 12, 16, 19 instead of 0, 4, 7. If you add 12 to the number, it goes up an octave. So you can pick whatever notes you want. You don't have to stick with mine. These are just designed to be the chords that everything kind of consistently sticks to. You can make basses. Oh, also the, the exclamation point fifths in the piece of paper that's just dropped on the floor. The uh, exclamation point uh, fifths is what engages the chord organ circle of fifths thing on the root. If you leave that off, it'll be stock. And as you can see, oh no wait, this is not the, this is not the bass. This is a lower frequency ARP. You can see it's starting two octaves down and then going up. This one is one that I came up with, which I have in two octaves. It is a, um, what I call ambient, 
meaning that these are all notes that are hovering around the same place in the keyboard. If you're playing a different chord, instead of going like here and then here, and then up and down the keyboard, you're playing similar notes, but just arranging them differently. So it's always got a different inversion, but the inversions are all centering around the same numbers. And this gives us the difference between, say, our low chord here and our high chord here. The low chord is regular chords, as you can see I wrote LC on it, and the high chord is high ambient. This is high ambient. So it's switching between these, as you can see many of the notes are the same. If you're sticking in the same key, the notes are going to be kind of the same. So what can happen is if you're gliding two different notes or if you're doing just a series of chords, getting an ambient feel might be having the chords sitting in the same place. similar place and that's because the numbers written on this here it's often possible to use the same notes and it changes the notes only when it absolutely has to so we can go to very different chords but the ambient uh, options for the chord are going to try to keep the same notes as much as humanly possible and that's very relevant when you get into glide which at some point I'm going to repower this entire machine, it'll make a big power supply thump and show you what the glide does because I've got some stuff set up to demonstrate that. We've also got a chorus thing available. See many of the same notes? That's what the, that's what the ambient is about, is to make it be very similar. I have made a special um, bass, which I'm currently using. As you can see, this has a glide setting on it, but it's not going to do very much. The bass does a special thing with glide and stuff. I have a low octave and a higher octave. So 24 and a minus 12. You could also do zero for a third octave up, but I'm doing a special thing here where if you glide this bass, it's going to tend to try to change the notes that it's playing because you go to different chords and they're sort of different inversions. When you're gliding notes, which I'll show you in a moment, we're getting up to that, some of this, the extra things, it's going by which order in the stack. Like the first note is going to glide to the next first note. The second note is going to glide to a second note. Third note is going to glide to a third note. Now, if we're doing an ambient chord, like this, you can see that the second and third notes are usually 11-17, because they're present in many of these chords. So they're just always sitting there. Other notes can glide around them, but they're going to try to stay the same. Everything doesn't glide everywhere like a THX noise, unless you want it to which is what this bass setting does, is you got these notes and then wherever there's two low notes and one slightly higher one and they're in an octave, but they're set up so that between any two chord changes, it's going to glide as much as humanly possible. Like if you just went to a different root, then it would be forced to glide. But if you're just selecting a different chord, it's gonna glide as many of these oscillators as far as it can because it's picking a different position for the high octave each time. So, second, third, first, second, third, first, second, third. Almost any change that you make, even a change between the same note, like 
minus 24 and minus 24, you'll notice that it's swapping the position of the high octave. So those two oscillators will glide and swap uh, positions. And if you have a glide that's fast enough, that it just makes a sort of blurp on the noise, what you get is this effect. Check this out. This is the Moog. Uh, how about... Thank you. This is the effect that I'm getting with the uh, chord organ sub bass with those three notes. If I have no glide on these things, it will be a uh, changing note like this. But if one of the oscillators has a glide, we get an effect like this. One of the oscillators is going immediately to the note, and one of them is slower. You can kind of do that with the chord organ by shuffling the position of the notes in it. And that's what I'm talking about with this stuff, is uh, being able to manipulate those things and what you would do with the bass, if you wanted the bass to have a chunkier attack, is... Make the glide faster. So it's doing this thing. But... Just fast enough to cause a squelch. And that would be something that you do with the base of the chord organ. So when it changes a note, there is something interesting going on rather than just the usual sine wave. And that's another thing that you can do with the chord organ that I was going to talk about. And that's kind of like, it, I, I called this a stream of masterclass. So I'm kind of going into everything that I'm doing, no matter how long it takes in the hope that if anybody really gets into this or wants to really work out with um, a chord organ that they've given my firmware to, that, that they will have a chance to do that. And I'm keeping, uh, <laughs> I'm keeping on track as well as I can, but this is going to get to the place where I need to start rebooting it because I have got these to show as well. These are alternate cards for the chord organ that I've taped extra tape uh, paper to. So high ambient, let's just go over to straight up high ambient. Give it to some kind of nice voltage that I can be consistent with. Actually, I don't even need to do that because... some of these down so that we have only a high ambient on there. And then what we're going to do, since I think we have everything shut off reasonably well, is kill the power to the modular system, which will power everything down, and then restart it with a different option. And we're going to have a slightly different... Here, let's do that. It'll sound kind of like this. Here. 
That wasn't too overwhelmingly loud, I don't think. If we power it on and hit play, we're going to get mostly similar chords. It's going to restart, so our chord, our uh, Turing machines are starting at zero. But we got everything powered down. It's only this that we're listening to now. We're not listening to any of these other guys. So what is high ambient plus 32767? It is a glide factor. And if I plug this in, and it works, which we're going to assume hopefully that it will, here's a different programming for that. Three two seven six seven is not a glide speed that is available on the stock uh, chord organ. As you can see, it's starting at a nice low note and it's finding its way to that series of chords that we heard before. Gradually getting there. And it's also starting on the sine wave. Doesn't look like it because it's showing that, but... This is what it's really doing. And now it has found its way. It takes about 20 seconds at 32767. This is the slowest possible glide setting. I actually used it for a track not, not long ago, quite a while back. Every time it gets a new... Um, chord position in here, it's going to glide to the new chord position. And set to 32767, that's just a really, really, really big glide. There's also other things that we can do, which is to stack the oscillators. What that means is, where's my settings? Which I was finding recently did not work on single oscillator setups. So beware with that. But let's say we start with something like this. What you're also hearing here, seeing as we're not updating the oscillators any, this has stack on it too. So rather than just having like three or four notes, it's going to pick uh, eight notes for four or six notes for three and offset a couple of them a tiny little amount. That gives you a chorusy kind of effect and that's what you're hearing now because we're not updating the pitch. Since we're not updating the chord, the glide is settled down. Again, this is glide of 32767. And this chorusy effect is the stock stack. So if you stick with the stock stack, then it's gonna sound like this. I'm sorry, I had to do that. Um, and then if we update the pitch, 32767 is so slow that it's going to take forever to do, but and then we'll stop the uh, thing. and away it goes. Gliding to the new chord. And again, this is some space ambient stuff, doing it like this. Let me change the camera a little bit. Oh. Doing it like this is definite space ambient stuff. And the idea there is that you can have fun times like... Oh no, wait, that's... Signs and stuff. You can make very freaky things with a glide as slow as this. Anything that you set can be set up to be that slow. That is also why I set up the, um, let me find it now, the ambient chords. Again, if you were doing glide like this, every, every position like first, second, third, fourth, is going to glide to the respective thing in the next one, the next chord that you reach. 
So if you're going from 1117 to another 1117, that will not make the things glide. Ambient is going to have more fixed notes for this reason. I just chose to have it be that way, to have them be as similar as humanly possible in the middle there. And then some of the extremes change quite radically. But um, the idea is that they should be consistent. And again, you're hearing... Uh, you're hearing some uh, stack on this oscillator. But hey, let's just hear lots of stack. Uh, I'm looking around for my options. Again, just for the hell of it, let's go back to this, which I think does not have... Um, Yeah, that sounds to me... That sounds to me like straight oscillators. That does not have stack. But what about this one, you may ask? And I have GL written on it, which is wrong, but... Um, what happens if you have a glide factor that's a little unusual? Now, in... The way that this is set up currently, and let me shut this off and go back to the one that has glide, so you can listen to that and maybe hear it wandering around a little bit while we're at it. So we got a very, very slow glide up to its final positions, and that's fine, that's what we're expecting. The stock glide, the way I've got it set up, defaults to a position of 1,000. And that is a offset of just a few cents, enough to make it chorus. And that's what you're hearing here. If you pick the glide, uh, the uh, stack number to be higher, it's going to slow down the um, rate of... You hear how it's kind of chorusing? If you slow that down, it makes it start sounding like the notes are just fading in and out. They'll start canceling each other out. You can hear it also on the triangle wave. I keep hitting the wrong uh, button for this. Here's a triangle wave. Or on the square wave, individual notes will sort of fade in and out of a pulse width modulation tone, because that's literally what's happening there. And that means that on that one, very slow uh, stack values that are high, like 32767, will gradually make the oscillator change between square wave and the finest pulse wave imaginable. With the sine, all that's going to happen is the note will fade in and out of silence. So we'll hear these individual notes in the chord fading in and out. With the sawtooth wave, it's a bit of a combination of those things. And with the triangle wave that I programmed in, again, I keep not hitting the right one. You're getting a combination of it, like it will get louder and softer, but um, you also hear a little bit of a tonality. But wait, you ask, what is this thing that you mislabeled GL12? Because it's not a glide 12. What I've got programmed in here is a stack value of 12. Now the way I've got the stack programmed in this version of the firmware, rather than being a fixed number, if you pick 1000 or don't write anything at all, it'll default to the stock amount of uh, stack chorusing. If you pick a really slow number, it's doing it in slow motion, like I said. If you pick 1, it will go to an octave. You'll get an octave of whatever is happening because it's dividing the amount by dividing the offset by whatever this number is like if it's three two seven six seven it's dividing what would be an octave of pitch shift right down to a tiny 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 offset if you divide um, an octave by 12 what do you get you get a semitone so a, a stack value of 12 which I have incorrectly called GL on this, will give you 
kind of a chord, kind of like. I think that's giving me a... No, I'm wrong. That is, in fact, glide a 12. So here, while we're playing with that, I guess I'm not quite done. At least I can reach this stuff. I'm going to quickly punch in the stack value of 12 I was telling you about in this other card, and I'll just have to remember to put it back afterwards. Let's see now. So I do remember how to do that just off the top of my head, so what I'm going to have to do is click away from this, go into here, open up this thing. Oh, see, what I had was a stack of 200. That's still pretty normal. It's a fast chorusing, but it's not too crazy. Now what I've just written on this one is stack 12. So let's see what we get out of there. And if you want, and I do have chat up, even though there's not many people here, here is stack 12, it should be. <laughs> that is still the high ambient chord, but now it's doubled by another chord that's exactly as one semitone off. Fun, fun, fun. So there we go, and we can pick the same settings. It's pretty rough. Oh, but let's go even crazier. Just a moment. What would it sound like if that had a glide of 32767? Let's find out. Let's find out right now because we can. So, just opening this up again on the computer and editing the text, typing exclamation point, capital G-L-I-D-E, 32767. If you pick anything larger, it'll just scale it down because that's the maximum one you can have within the integer formulation that it's got. And if you pick lower than one, it won't take it because it would require a divide by zero. So I check to make sure that can't happen. Let's see how horrible this is. It's the combination of those last two things. And now we have a full on THX from hell thing going on, where we are pursuing a chord that will change. Our glide value is 32767, just like this. And our stack setting is 12, which is exactly one semitone. But wait, there's more. Why don't we keep doing it and as long as I'm doing this, and let me open up uh, Chromium. Yeah, the, the glide setting is uh, 32767 when it's doing the crazy like that. And let us uh, move this so that I can control this. And what shall we do? Uh, we'll do a stack of one. And that will give us a octave. And we'll make the glide be uh, 10,000. And save that, close it, eject it. It is fairly quick fooling around with this 
kind of madness as long as there we go you don't want to screw up the these little cards are really cheap because they're about one dollars worth so this is now a stack of one and it's a much faster glide and there we are full THX and since it is the chord organ ambient setting certain notes will change and other notes will not actually a bunch of them are changing it's going to a very high pitch Let's slow our tempo way down so this has time to react. So here's another thing you can do with the chord organ firmware where it keeps trying to sort of reposition these notes. And as you can hear, like I said, with the, the way this is set up, the ambient setting, some of the notes are very predictably in one place. Other notes are changing fairly radically. And we're hearing an octave effect because we're using a stack of one. But wait, you hear, or wait, I say, what happens if you're using a stack of like two? Well, that would be taking the pitch offset and rather having it being a full octave, it's half of an octave. That should be a fifth. So, if we take this out again, power down the whole system doing so. It's like hot plugging stuff. And plug it in and we tell this to be, open it up again, and we tell it to be a stack of two. We're gonna get a freaky chord and Remember, we can program freaky chords in, but this is going to automatically make a freaky chord based on the notes being a fifth out. And let's throw it back into the chord organ and power on the system. It's defaulting to sine, even though it doesn't look like it. And here's what it sounds like with these chords happening. And your stack value is two. It's like a fifth off. It still sounds like a chord, but it's a little strange. and it does have to select a new chord to make something happen. So when this reaches this point is probably when it's gonna change. And there you have it. So you're doing all of this with this kind of interface. Like, uh, here, I'll stick this little thing over here. You got a text file. It says this stuff in it. It's got these numbers. These are your 16 chords. It's falling on the floor. Let me see if I can even reach this without knocking over the camera. There we go. Meanwhile, I'm going to take this chord and put into ultimate deep space just for laughs. This is my sound effect for explaining the remainder of this. See, you can do all kinds of cool things. All I added was reverb. 
but um, here's the way you work it. You've got a text file that says this, and you put in the little exclamation point for the controls, like it says glide, it says glide one, and we can do one through 3,000, 32,767, or whatever. Uh, five or 10 is fairly normal for the zwipping little glide that you use on ARPs and things. Triangle is turning on the triangle wave in the fourth position. You can also do, and I might demonstrate that because it might be fun to, to hear it, alternate uh, wavetables, and I'll show you what it defaults to. I haven't made my own yet. And fifths engages my circle of fifth stuff. And if you put stack and then a number, you get that chorusy effect. So yeah, let us... Oop. Go into deep space. Man, nobody beats my reverbs. I have MIDI verbs, uh, series MIDI verbs, one feeds into the next. So let's take a moment and redo this to demonstrate if it loads up, because eventually these SD cards are going to die because they're cheap. Uh, no more glide of 10 million billion. How about a nice little glide of 20? No more stack of two, because that's not what we're demonstrating anymore. And no more triangle. We'll go back to the normal thing. And exclamation point W-A-V-E-S gives us the other options for those. And we're still doing the uh, ambient setting. Uh, sitting out of there, and away we go. So, plug this in, turn back on. And let's hear what the stock settings are for this, because again, Here's your uh, sign. It seems to have started up in the last setting. So this is what we were already listening to before. Here's the square. Again, same thing that we already heard. I've got uh, very little change here on the, the filter. So this is close to raw output. Here's a triangle wave. Actually, you know what? Let's do literally a raw output, uh, except for I gotta grab the other patch for that. Let's grab the patch that's literally coming out of that filter and do a truly unfiltered sound. Here we go. A little loud. You can hear this is not the cleanest of oscillators. And so here's our sign. Although one of the things about that is I have it set up to be a fairly high output, so there's that. Here's the square. You can hear how it's not the cleanest oscillator sound. And that's a more normal glide behavior. And here's our triangle, or our sawtooth. It's kind of cool, but it's not going to stand up to analog sign or stuff, I can tell you that, because the, the sign is limited by the uh, bit depth, which is about 12 bits, and also the sample rate. The uh, square and the SAR are limited by the sample rate, and they're going to alias to some extent. They're gonna, there's going to be a jitter in there. And then the default is this kind of semi-pulsy wave. I usually have a triangle in, it, in its place because I like the triangle better. But this is what it comes as. This is a stock chord organ. And then if you engage waves, now we start getting wavetables. Here's one of the wavetables. 
You can see it's blinking also to show that it's on the wavetables. Here's another. These seem to be made by just sort of throwing harmonics on. It's like it was, it's like they were made, it's a 256 step wavetable. And it's like they were made by just like using Pafnutty or something and generating harmonics in a very basic way. So we've got this as well, and this is kind of more like a sine wave with a high octave in there. They all sound kind of like Hammond organ sounds or something. There's another one. It would sound like nicer Hammond organ sounds if the DAC was better, which it kind of isn't, so. Again, here's another, and we can filter it. Or we could filter it if it was going through the filter, I should say. Yet another. So this is one of the things that you can do where you can have these wavetables. They're built into the stock chord organ. These are available even if you haven't put in the Air Windows firmware. I'd like to come up with other options and here we are back at the sign, if I'm not mistaken. It seems like we only have uh, two levels of these. I thought there were three. Fast blink. Very slow blink. Okay, so there we go. So here is another wavetable option. Another wavetable option. These are cool. I just feel like if I sampled the analog synths like Sawtooth or whatever, I'd be able to come up with something interesting that might work. Here's this sort of pulsy one. And then these ones where it's not blinking at all, these are just the raw um, signal generator outputs of the Teensy. It's designed to make this closest approximation to a sign and so on. So yeah. These are the things we have available to us using this kind of rig. And of course in analog you can take these things and See, I prefer to use things like filter resonance to get those uh, organy kind of sounds because it gets crazier. And we can set up stuff like this and then start bringing in. for like three hours. We got like two people left in the live stream. If anybody left has questions, then by all means ask them. I guess my stamina is greater than any possible listener. But this is, this is what I use for my stuff. Having covered everything about the chord organ that I wanted to, 
I can just play you out.
the end of my stream. Thanks everybody, this has been a real trip. I'm not sure how much sense this whole process has made to people, but uh, all things considered, uh, this covers stuff that I really wanted to talk about. And I think it's gone through, to the best of my ability, the entire range of the chord organ. Because I'm really into these things. And although, as I demonstrated with that, uh, sort of raw sample output, you start sort of going into them and listening to the raw output and not filtering it or anything, and you, you might overlook what they're capable of. And I think that would be a real tragedy. Oh, also I should note, um, these are the root, and I had to tune these pots, which are actually set to chromatic very carefully so that all of the chords and things would change to a new free, a new note at the right time. So that stuff has to be tuned. But um, that also helps you set up the sort of tonal centers that you're working with. But yeah, I feel like these are potentially overlooked modules. They are a reflash of the... So Flash what you get is... Yep, I'll see what I can do. This, this is the raw output of, of radio music. That is a whole pile of audio that I just made from other live streams and chopped up and put into the chord organ so that I could swap back and forth among it really quickly. So the raw chord organ tends to sound like uh, this. A little surprised if, if you're fooling did, around with that, um, it might be something that I know something or it that might be something be... that I know. And if you don't like that, you get to put the firmware for radio for uh, the chord organ onto the radio music. And it's the, exactly the same buttons, knobs. You can get a different faceplate, but you don't necessarily have to have a different faceplate to use it. Uh, you cannot reverse the faceplate because this and the button have to be oriented a certain way. So you can't just swap it over and have that work. But these are DIYable. You can get kits from Thonk. And I consider that these uh, kits uh, for the Music Thing Modular stuff are some of the best DIY kits I've ever seen. The way of organizing them is extremely approachable. You get these little uh, plastic bags with like 100k resistor, two 250k resistors, and a capacitor, and it says what's on there seems to be always correct. And when you're looking to solder in like the 250k one, uh, you look for the little envelope that has the correct one, and it'll say like, this envelope contains six of this value. And you look for the little stri strip of six resistors, and you know that's the one. And you can check to make sure that that's true, but it seems to be very well done. And that just makes it more approachable to assemble. Like, even if you're not having this clued of a day, uh, I've, I still found it very easy to get into. So, you can buy these things at your usual modular prices, but if you can solder and put stuff together, these are extremely accessible to get into modular stuff with. And again, you can re-trigger them. Speaking of which, come to think of it, uh, I'll go right back to the illustration of the consistency to the samples. Because I think that is the thing. It's like a reset. Modus most frequent. Or I'll highlight it. And yes, mode is most frequent, but as far as audio Retriggering in a square wave or retriggering and the way mm, 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 on any mm, kind of trigger mm, input. Mm, 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 
and that's a radio music. You could put snares and things on there as well. It's not the quickest to trigger of any sample thing, but it's one of the cheapest available sample players, so you can put drum things in here as well. And then you can do your other craziness. Like this. And I just can't say enough about these modules. They are incredibly flexible, and I might be coming up with other firmware, because I've already done one version of the firmware, and I didn't do a good job of explaining it, so I don't think it went anywhere. And that's why I've spent hours today just patching in and showing every possible range of what I could do with these. I think they're really easily overlooked. I think you can get pretty amazing sounds out of them if you know how to exploit it and do what you want. As you've seen with the unpatching and repatching of these, it's pretty quick to like type new stuff into it. And the whole range of using the uh, organizational factor that I came up with of your Actually, let me dangle it down here, if I can, which maybe I can't. Uh, it's falling over. Come on, yeah. Oh, it's not going to work. Uh, away it goes. Anyways, the way of arranging this where the chords that you pick are not just inversions of the same chord, but they're distinct chords that all make sense within a key system. And then using the circle of fifths to offset the root, which is part of the Air Windows firmware, so that you can go to more unusual chords and have it change only one note out of the key that you're in. These things make it the most exploitable generative chord sequence kind of thing that I think anybody is currently doing. And that includes Symphonian, because Symphonian you have to program what it's doing. And they're not doing the full, uh, not yet, anyhow, it's always possible for that to be added. And I bet people could do this with Disting as well. But um, so far I think this is the only way of getting hold of this particular approach to chords and circle of fifths that like I demonstrated for hours you can play music over and get a sense of uh, what chord the synthesizer is jamming in while having it able to go to anywhere in the circle of fifths. Any key, any note, any chords, full 12 tones available to you through only the power of CV will take you literally anywhere. And it's all in how you manage it. It's all in how much random voltage you put into various places and what you're doing. The Air Windows Chord Organ firmware is a free open source, or I think it should match whatever Tom Wetwell is doing, which may very well be open. Let me use the source. Anywho, um, I'm pretty sure that's open source. And it is free to be used because I am supported on Patreon, and that's how I keep doing this stuff. Usually each week I am doing a plugin release, which is an audio unit and also Mac, Windows, and Linux VSTs, and I do this pretty much every Sunday. I've been doing many of them. I have hundreds of them out, so I figured I could be excused for spending quite a few hours and demonstrating this other thing that gives me so much pleasure which is also somebody else's product. It's like, I don't work for a Music Thing Modular. And although I'm a super big fan of Tom Whitwell, I'm not sure how much he knows about this that I'm doing. This can be my little peace offering. And also with regard to the source, it's up on GitHub. I will link to that. Um, I'm not putting in a pull request to have it incorporated in Tom's like actual stock. Uh, chord organ firmware unless he'd like me to. 
I do have a couple of bug fixes, but there's also a bunch of big changes. And so, Tom, if you're listening to this and you'd like this code to be integrated into the main code, just ask and I'll file a pull request and we can include it. Uh, failing that, you can download it off of airwindows.com by looking up Air Windows Cord Organ. And uh, this is the most recent version of that. And again, it is absolutely free because it is supported by Patreon. And I don't need to be paid directly by the plugin or by the firmware update in order to keep going. And with that, let me fire up uh, OBS and say goodbye for today and go about like posting this to relevant places. Um, any of you who are looking at this um, after it's gone up, uh, that's cool. I'm still deciding whether to leave that initial jam up or not. I suppose I could. Um, it didn't really change very much other than the usual randomness. So maybe I'll edit it out and it can be just those who showed up for the stream got to enjoy it. Anyways, I'm tired. I need to make another cup of coffee or maybe my tacos for dinner or something and get all of my stuff back into shape because everything is a little bit wonky and woozy and I've lost track of what I'm doing with my life and I've lost track of how this works. So with that, I will say you'll get as much leave. You'll, you'll get as much leave and I will talk to you folks next week and I'll be doing music streams using this exact uh, setup and twisting it around in as many ways as I can. Um, I'm still deciding whether I'm going to stick with my Tuesday and Wednesday or whether I want to go with Tuesday and Thursday and basically finish up in time to catch call -in streams because that's happening. Anyways, talk to you guys later. Bye-bye.